there is a lack of understanding in terms of diversity. And that doesn't just you know, come with autism, that comes with students across the board, learning to accept someone. It's something that is a critical skill that every student needs to learn how to do. Desk rent is $100. Once a month, the students do have to pay bills. Electric is 10. I was totally impressed um, how they were able to manage a checkbook and put the deposit on this side and the withdrawals on this side. Here's $110. Have a nice day. We're actually learning how to draw up vaccines. Dr. Lisa is like the diamond in a rock. To have her to integrate with these students, it is a relationship every teacher wishes that their children would have. And then most importantly, find out if she wants to get the pet spayed or neutered. Okay. Okay. In which book does Miss Mackle receive a quilt as a gift? My team is Raging Readers, and I think that we're going to win this year. Hello and welcome. I'm Sean Spiller, host of Classroom Close-Up New Jersey. We live in a world on the move. It feels like we're on a roller coaster of changes in the way we communicate, how we express ourselves, even how we think about our institutions and our beliefs. As a teacher, I've seen firsthand the benefits and the challenges for young people in this age of instant information. So how do we teach students to thrive in a world of rapid change? On this episode, we'll highlight school programs that are focusing on collaboration, tolerance, and community. A good first step is awareness, which is where we'll begin. Bubbles for Autism is a project where we have all of our staff members and students pre-K through eighth grade come together as one. We meet outside on the track and we provide bubbles and supplies and we blow the bubbles for 10 to 15 minutes just showing our support so it's a symbol. That symbolic show of support is just one piece in a school-wide initiative focused on understanding and acceptance of individuals living with autism as well as other differences. The program is led by the school's paraprofessionals and takes place in April, which is Autism Awareness Month. Sylvia Donaldson, who is one of our paraprofessionals, has been doing a lot over the years with the autism community, raising awareness. And this is something that the education support professionals, the ESP, has decided would be a wonderful project that we could do because we really feel very connected to the students that we work with. I've been here for about 17 years and working with children with all disabilities. We, we all obviously love these kids and just want to do as much as we can for each and every one of them. The first thing you're going to do is untie one shoe. Then you're going to put on your gloves all the way and you're going to try to tie your shoe. Teachers take part as well with lessons about autism and exercises that help students develop empathy by letting them experience what it's like to be challenged with a disability. For example, trying to do tasks that require fine motor skills while wearing gloves, or trying to read and write while wearing goggles that impair their vision. So put your pencils and beads down. How was it tying your shoe? Did y'all get your shoe tied with the gloves on? No. Why not? Garrett? Our hands were too fat to tie our shoes. So you couldn't use your fingers the way you're used to using them, correct? It's important to educate students about differences because there is a lack of understanding in terms of diversity. And that doesn't just, you know, come with autism. That comes with students across the board, learning to accept someone uh, who is, you know, a different colored skin, who has a different language, who has a different home life. It's something that is a critical skill that every student needs to learn how to do. And this is just one way that we can help them learn that understanding. Bubbles for Autism includes a number of community and school-sponsored efforts to help raise money for Autism New Jersey, an organization dedicated to improving lives of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. One of the main fundraisers is the sale of autism awareness pins handcrafted by the school's Helping Hands Club. These buttons are made out of old puzzle pieces. Some of them we painted to get more of some of the colors and we hot glue or add adhesive. We glue them together and we put a pin on the back and we sell them for one dollar. Our success in fundraising has just been extraordinary. I would say combined we do well over a thousand dollars in donations to Autism New Jersey every year um, and it makes us feel great that we're able to do that as a community effort. I really like 
making them because when you sell them, we donate the money and all the money helps people understand people with autism so we can create a more compassionate community. The partnership with Autism New Jersey also includes participation in their Autism Ambassador Program. Quite a lot of our staff has become Autism Ambassadors through Autism New Jersey. Not just our education support professionals, but our teachers as well. And what that means is that we sign up that we will help those that work with us and are around us understand autism. We are able to get supplies then for each classroom. They send us a packet of information, booklets, pens, pencils, that so we can spread that awareness. Bubbles for Autism may be an annual event, but promoting acceptance is the school's year-round mission. I think a school needs many events, so you don't do a one-time event in September or October and expect that that's going to carry over with a student. And I think the autism awareness becomes very important because they're children that they see, they're people that they know. They could also be adults in their community. So it's just another way to help students know that when they go out into the real world, there's all kinds of people that they're gonna work with, they're gonna interact with, hopefully they're gonna you know, go on vacation and recreate with. And I think that's a huge piece of what we do. The Bubbles event and the autism awareness has really helped me to grow both personally and professionally. It's given me the opportunity to, to look outside of a small project and help to grow and make that bigger. And I've really enjoyed expanding that into the community and just seeing you know, in what ways we can make that community school connection and education support professional and community connection because I feel all of that is so important. If you have the parent, you have the community, and you have the school working together as one, you're going to obviously then have the best possible situation for those students, for all students. The Ambassador Campaign is open to everyone, promoting a society that embraces individuals with autism. We'll add a link to our website so you can find out more. Schools have the potential to connect young learners to the world and to introduce them to how the world works. Every child is eventually asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Police officer. Star clerk. Department of Public Works. The nutritionist. It's a tough question, especially when you don't know your options. But not for the fourth graders at Durban Avenue Elementary. I'm a doctor and I'm representing the new tick. In the beginning of the year, students took field trips. We went to the post office. We also went to the police station. And then we met with the mayor and she had the kids come up and sit in the council chairs. We had members of the community come in and speak about what their jobs were. The students were able to be introduced to a lot of different career types. The field trips were just the beginning to the classroom economy, a real life community run by fourth graders. At the beginning of our economy, the boys and girls had to decide what kind of job that they wanted, and we had a list of jobs that they could choose from. Our classroom has shopkeepers, we have our police officers, we have our postmasters. We make sure everyone gets their homework and important notes that need to go home. We have our bill collectors. Water bills, how many times you use the waterfront sewage is for the bathroom, and then electric bills, how many times you use your Chromebook. Our bankers, our accountants. We write their name right here. We put the number of how, many, how much money we're giving them right here, and then we write it out in expanded form. And then we do have our dietitians, our doctors, and our vets. All the predators of eastern box turtles are fox cars, weasels, and crows. And we have our DPW, which do a wonderful job of keeping our classroom clean. Our job is like to sweep everything and make sure that everything's neat and not like messy. The students had job applications that they had to fill out. They had to be written in complete sentences. They had to know what qualities they had as a student that would help them be good at performing their job in the classroom. They have to perform activities daily in order to earn their paycheck. I just got paid $130. I'm off to the bank. They are rewarded for good behavior and doing extra work and going above and beyond. And they are then able to use the money that they've earned to save and 
use at our classroom store. So do you want to buy this? Yes. Hey. But much like the real world, there's also fines and bills to pay. Uh, if your computer's not charged or something, you have to pay. There's a fine for every bad thing that you do. Once a month, the students do have to pay bills. The monthly payments are desk rent is $100, water is $10, sewage is $10, electric is $10, and heat and heat slash air is $10. So that's a total of $140. I was totally impressed um, how they were able to manage a checkbook and put the deposit on this side and the withdrawals on this side. We just thought it was a life skill that a lot of them are not exposed to. Um, a lot of them didn't know that when you get a paycheck you have taxes taken from it. Durban Avenue tax, the Packham tax, New Jersey tax, United States tax, and nurses tax. So I have that much money left? Yes, you have. They really did very well with understanding the difference between saving and spending, and they easily connected that their hard work paid off for them. I have $105. Many of the kids, their roles are daily roles, and they know that every day, if there are papers to pass back, I need to do that. My teacher knows that they need to take attendance, tell me the lunch count. I like check off if people have their homework. And then there are other positions like the dietitian and the doctors and the veterinarians that aren't something that we see every day in the classroom and that they have to be preparing on their own. Every doctor, dietitian, or veterinarian has to do a presentation once a month. And it is their responsibility to do all the research on their own. They decide what they want to do their presentation on. Hello, my name is Dr. Austin Rell, and my project is about smoking. We give them a few weeks notice and they'll come in with their presentation. It can be on a Chromebook, they could make a poster about it, they could do a slideshow if they wanted to. It's up to them how they want to do those presentations. Are there any questions? Yes, Kanan? That's what they get paid for, is doing those presentations and teaching the rest of the class about the subject that they're presenting on. The classroom economy is operating in the black, thanks to funding from an NJEA Frederick L. Hip grant. Next. The grant allowed me to take the field trips to see the members of the community. It also allowed us the opportunity to buy the supplies needed to run the economy and to stock our classroom store. When the students leave fourth grade, I really hope that they have a sense of responsibility. I want them to feel satisfied that they learned how to manage their money. I want them to be more organized, to reach a goal, and also to have a greater respect for people and their jobs. My job is a, to be a teacher. When we come back, connecting school, community, and our furry friends, right after this. Thank you so much for your letter. My whole mantra when I started teaching was reach before you teach, uh, which for me really meant make sure that I don't lose sight of sort of these heartbeats in front of me. The first prompt is what I love. Go! Peanut butter. What's the pet's name? Princess. These students saw a need in their community. It's okay. Some owners were struggling to feed and care for their pets. We want everybody to feel very welcome as part of our family here at Brim. So Karen Borelli-Luke and her students started the Chowhound House at the Dr. Charles E. Brim Medical Arts High School in Camden. We have free pet food. We have um, cat and dog food for the community. We also are giving free inoculations, and we also have um, free spay neuter that will be performed at a later date. Then you can mix it with your needle and just mix it. One of the unique aspects of this project is when the Brim students actually assist during various medical and surgical procedures. We're actually learning how to draw up vaccines. So he's mixing up a distemper vaccine for a dog. Dr. Lisa is like the diamond in a rock. To have her to integrate with these students, it is a relationship every teacher wishes that their children would have. Bring the pet up to the doctor, and the doctor's gonna talk out loud, 
so that you know like what the exam report says. As a hospital, we work with some underprivileged communities because their pets don't have the ability to get the care that they need, but it's great that the students are making it happen here. The students are actually helping their community get the care that their pets need. And I'm just going to set them down, okay? Put it the student's program actually starts with communication and talking to owners about what the pet's needs are, and then they learn about um, technical skills, like how to draw up vaccines, how to take a medical history. So in the hospital, they actually take a hand in preparing the pet for surgery, taking their vitals, clipping them, cleaning them, you know, and they work right beside a technician. So the technician's making sure they're doing everything like exactly like it should be done. And then most importantly, find out if she wants to get the pet spayed or neutered, okay. okay, at the clinic. For them to say that they actually are right there with the surgeries and the incisions, the inoculations, drawing, the shots and everything like that, th that's experience you can't even buy. And they're getting it at a high school level here. We are partnered with NJEA to be a hub for our local neighborhood. So we really want our school to serve as the heartbeat of our area and one way we've identified that our community really needs is to have pet care. Multiple one centimeter masses on abdomen. I came here to be a doctor but since this whole program I want to be a vet now because I like the interaction, I like having to talk to different type of people about their animals, know about what they've been through, so it's just life changing. Along with her colleagues and students, Karen has worked hard to make this project into the success that it is today. Classroom Close Up first visited Chow Hound House back in 2010. That's when we met Kevin and Jamil, co founders of the Chow Hound Project. When they're done, they got it on, cut this. Okay? We're still on our main mission, which is the great part, you know, the humane education. And we also have tons of partners now, which we didn't have before. So. It's just getting bigger and better. Yep, no problem, no problem. Thank you guys for coming out. Currently, I'm at uh, Rowan University, a uh, biology major, aspiring to be a cardiologist. Brim was that gateway to actually keeping me on the right path. Like, it was so many things going wrong in my life, and it just seemed like everything was going downhill. But when I got to Brim, it seemed like all the teachers, Miss uh, Karen Borelli, she was that inspiration that really helped push me in the right direction. Jamil, unfortunately, his sophomore year in high school, his mom was incarcerated. She had asked that I take him under my wing and give him all the things that he would need that she wouldn't be there for. And she knew that her son wanted to be a cardiologist. And she knew that I would be able to provide and give the guidance that he needed. So he became my son. We got him ready for prom, we got him his flowers, and so it was more than just the chow house. He was also my son. And now that he's a senior in college, you know, he has two moms now to be there for his graduation. She's honestly like my second mom. Like, I, I don't know what I would do without her. <laughs> this remarkable group not only cares about each other and the families and pets in their community, but they've also started to rescue at-risk animals from other states. I spoke to uh, the Chow Hounds, and um, they actually went on a trip with us. Every 30 days, we drive to Georgia, and we bring back, on average, 250 animals. In the south, there isn't a lot of spaying or neutering going on, so we, we want it to be a fix for one state in particular. I think a lot of our students come in feeling as though they might not necessarily mean a whole lot individually, but then they become part of this group and part of this organization and they really see how many people they positively impact in the community and it really empowers them for whatever they want to go on to be in the future. One day I would like to be in surgery or critical care. So getting exposure to the veterinary field also gives me humane interactions. To see the impact and the, how passionate and compassionate my students are about this, that's the reward.
Here we are at the Battle of the Books, and you can tell the excitement in this room. I mean, this is just tremendous. But what gave you the idea to, to get involved and do this? Actually, my son, who's a senior in high school now, when he was in middle school, his school did this, um, but they participated in America's Battle of the Books, where you pick a, a top team from your school that moves on to competition with other schools. We, Mrs. LeCastro and I, presented it to our principal, but the three of us decided it would be better to be able to include all students who wanted to participate, so we decided to keep it just in-house, and everyone can participate, everyone comes out, the families come out and just have one battle where they all compete. All right, so here we go with our first question, 21 questions, are you ready? In which book is the family so poor that all they eat is bread with margarine, boiled potatoes, and cabbage? At the beginning of the year, any students that are interested come to a Battle of the Books meeting. They form teams. We assign them to a coach. Kids always come up to me and say, I'm just not a reader, Ms. Delente. And I tell them, it's not, a, it's not that you're not a reader, you just haven't found your right book yet. Everybody has a book, you just haven't found it yet. Before I came to Bow School, I really was not much of a reader. I don't know how, but I just like started reading. Like Once I got into Bow School, I guess it was all the fun books that I saw. As it gets closer to the battle, we have all the teams, they come and they decorate their t-shirts. People, What was your favorite book on the list to read? Malachi, which one was your favorite? Mine will probably have to be The View from Saturday. Why? Because I love how in the beginning, it just went from a whole academic. I'm a very competitive guy, so I like to compete a lot. In which book does Miss Mackle receive a quilt as a gift? There's 21 books that they all have to read combined. I had seven students on my team, so each student took three books. Here we are between rounds. Tell me what's going on. Um, we just had our first round mm -hmm. where we had 17 teams participating in the battle. They answered 21 questions, and now we are knocking out seven of the teams and taking the top ten teams to move on to the second round. Well, i got to tell you, based on the excitement in the room, it sounds like everybody's in the lead. like get out of the world and put yourself in the book. I think I like reading because when I was younger, my mom, she would always read to us one book every night since we were like babies. What's it like being part of that team for her? Well, I think she, well, for her, she meets new friends that have the same interests. And I noticed that because she has those same interests, she builds stronger friendships because they have the common things, you know, of reading books together, they go to the library, you know, they can do different things together. I kind of want to win, because last year I didn't win. Real Girls Read? Yeah! Girl Power 2.0? And Owls in Reading? Congratulations to all of our team. All right, you ready? In which book is a team composed of a redhead, a blonde, a brunette, and a kid with hair as black as ink on paper? And the answer is The View from Saturday. In 
today's educational world, there's so much push on testing and, you know, sometimes we lose focus of what we're really here for and that's to give a love of learning. And I think it's a great thing for the kids to come in and be able to have fun with it. To kind of lose all the stress that goes along with that and just get back into what we're here for and that's to love learning and love reading and just love being here in general. Our congratulations to the winning team and to all the students who competed in Battle of the Books. Remember the words of Maurice Sendak who said, there's so much more to a book than just the reading. He was referring to the sensation of books, the feel, the smell, but from there consider the power of reading and the power of learning, opening a portal to events and ideas that can bring communities together, inspire future careers, and make the world better for everyone. That's exactly what we find in our school visits each week. We hope you were inspired by the stories we shared today. Thanks so much for watching. If you missed any part of this episode or to search our video library, go to classroomcloseup.org. Next time, we'll focus on a materials processing program that is not your traditional woodshop class. Until then, for Classroom Close-Up New Jersey, I'm Sean Spiller. See you soon. <laughs>